chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Um, and as you flip there, um, 
you, you wouldn't have to hang out with me long enough, or very long, I should say, to uh, begin to get a sense that I um, have quite the independent streak in me. Like, I, I like to do things my way. Like, I've always kind of had that disposition. I can be a little stubborn um, and a little bit, uh, uh, you know, I was probably one of those strong-willed children, as you would call them, right? Remember that statement? It just means a brat. <laughs> we just tried to make it nice. And um, so when I was in fifth grade, <clears throat> we were living with my grandparents at the time. My mom and I my mom, uh, had moved out from my uh, dad, and we were kind of in a year transition living with my grandparents. And I was at my strongest of strong-willed moments, probably, at least at that point. And um, I remember my grandfather, and I don't remember even what the argument was, but my grandfather was doing his best to kind of try to rein me in and try and get me, like, to not be such a strong-willed child. And um, I got so mad, I'm like, that's it, I'm leaving. So I grabbed a backpack and I stuffed probably a toy in there, and I walk out the front door of their house, and I lived up on the top of a hill. And I walk down the street, and it's down a hill, and I walk down to the corner, and I got to the fire, um, the fire hydrant at the end of the corner, it's probably about 15 or 20 houses down, and I was like, you know, <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> I, I, I got nowhere to go, I don't have a plan, I, I got nothing. And so I sat, I literally sat on that fire hydrant for like 15 minutes as like a 10 year old, and just was like, just sulking and trying to figure out how do I, like how do I fix it, what do I do now? Um, and then of course, I got up and I went back home to my grandparents' house and then kind of realized I, I didn't have it all together. I wasn't able to do it my own way. I didn't know everything. I wasn't in charge of everything. Um, there's something in me then and today that I'm not instinctively good at following. Like my first instinct isn't to follow. My wife is much more of a follower. She's more of a rule follower. Like she never did school and, and she always did her homework and she's more instinctive. I always joke and said, you'd be a perfect candidate for a cult. Um, but she just, she has that, she just, she wants to go along with it. She's like, that seems like a great play. Let's go there. And it's like, but I'm, I've always had that kind of instinctive to try and like pave my own way and do my own things. I'm not good instinctively at following. Um, there's a stubbornness and a desire for independence and autonomy. And, you know, you see this, like, in, in, in our sin nature, you see this all the way back in the garden, right? Like, this is, this is the, big, the big divide, as it were, in the fall, right? The, the Eve, we were just talking about this at Sunday school. Like, the, the, the Eve's desire, she wanted to be like God. That was the desire that, that was presented, knowing both good and evil. Which really, you could frame that out to say that it was being able to decide for yourself what is good or bad, what is right or wrong. It's that it's autonomy. It's the pride of autonomy. That's the thing. That's a fundamental thing that the human heart desires in our sin nature. Um, we think we know best. We want things our way. We want others to bend to our will. Um, it's really funny and kind of cute for a child to do that. Um, it can be damaging for adults, right? It can create a lot of ripple effects and problems, um, but it's deadly to our faith. It's absolutely deadly to our faith. See, in our faith sometimes even, we, we kind of want our version of Jesus. Like we want Jesus on our terms. So that, that desire for autonomy still kind of finds its way in. And, and we, want, we want him to fill our desires and our needs and our wants and do things our way. Rather than us, like we just sang about, saying, like, no, you are Lord. You are Savior. And the reality is, is that God has designed us purposely and specifically to function his way. Like, he's the designer. He's the creator. He knows what will allow us to best flourish, to be our best version of ourselves, to, um, to, to feel full and whole and at peace the best we can. And it's because he designed us that way. We were created in his image to reflect him. So he knows better than we do how we should best live. And yet we fight him, right? I do. I don't know about you guys. Maybe I'm the only one. But I fight him on it. Because his ways always feel, or not always, often feel counterintuitive and countercultural. 
right? Like, he'll be like, this is what it means to follow me. And I'm like, that seems like a really bad idea. <laughs> I just don't like that at all, right? It, it just, it's so counter. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so there's this tension and this, this thing that tugs within us constantly. The good news in all of this is that we're not alone. Uh, the disciples struggled with the exact same thing, and they were walking with Jesus. They, they had a version of Jesus that they wanted, that they expected. They had, a, they had a, a, a picture of what Messiah, who Messiah was going to be, what Messiah was going to do, and how this was all going to play itself out. But there's a secret that we can find that freedom and flourishing for your and I, freedom and flourishing for us, is really found in simply following Jesus. It, it, the simplicity, it, it's, it's really easy to understand and really hard to live. Right? Would you guys agree? Can I get an amen for that? <laughs> right? It's really, like, it's not hard to go, okay, you're God, I'm not God. You know, you know everything, I don't know anything. You lead, I follow. Like, that's, like, again, we could just say amen, close the book, and go to lunch. But it's really hard to live that out day in and day out. Because there's still that residual effect of our sin nature and our pride that just constantly has to be put to death. Because we just want, I want my way. I want to do it the way I want to do it. I think I know better than everyone else, right? We would all agree intellectually that this is true, right? That we would all say yes, amen. amen. He leads, I follow, I just need to follow him. I think what I want to challenge today and what we're going to talk about is how does that actually integrate into your life? There's a difference between understanding something here and then having it work its way down into your heart and then out into your life. Right? Like those, it's easy, like we can all agree what scripture says, but then does it actually shape the way I live and the way I love and the way that I serve and and how I confess and how I repent? Like does it does it find its way into those spaces of my heart and then does it play itself out? Or to what degree does it play itself out? That we go beyond the head and see our hearts reshaped and reoriented. And that's it's, it's this really this day-by-day, -day, lifelong journey of the Spirit transforming us. This is what sanctification is, is this journey of understanding and then integrating into our lives. And we're, like I said, we're going to be in Matthew 16. We're going to look at verses 24 through 28. And I really hope, I think it's going to help us to get some, um, this story, my hope and prayer has been that this helps gives us a couple of handholds that we can really grab onto practically as we look at this idea of what does it mean to just simply follow Jesus day in and day out. And so Matthew 16, I'm going to set the scene for you a little bit. So <clears throat> Jesus, at this point in his ministry, he's having to work overtime to manage expectations. Because as his ministry has grown, the expectations on him have grown. And, the, and, and kind of the voices and the tug and the pull of not just the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious authority who are now against him, like clearly against him, but also kind of the expectations of his own disciples, right? You're starting to hear things like, hey, so when you come into your kingdom, can I be on the right side and my brother on the left side, right? Like there's this expectation coming from the disciples themselves. Hey, Lord, when are you going to restore the kingdom? When are we going to beat up Rome? Like when does this all happen? So Jesus has been kind of managing that, and it's as they get closer to Jerusalem and closer to the cross, the intensity of that is going up. And he's having to become more direct and more clear with his disciples. He, he starts slow, right? Remember, think early on in the Gospels, he'll do a miracle and be like, I'm Messiah, don't tell anyone, right? Like he would do these, and you're like, why? You're trying to build a kingdom. Why would you not tell people you're trying to build a kingdom? But clearly what you see Jesus doing, just from a practical standpoint, is that if, if things got too hot too fast, then his ministry would be hindered. And so he's measured in how he starts to call people to himself. But those expectations are getting there. And so in chapter 16, they go to Caesarea Philippi, um, to a place called the Temple of Pan, um, which is in many ways, it's the epicenter of pagan worship for that time. Um, it was a grotto, a giant, it's actually really amazing, it's a giant like cave cart that's, that's in the rock. It's a natural spring in a grotto. And then in Roman times, like it had been a place of pagan worship, and then in Roman times, Rome built kind of like a, um, a building attached to it, and it was a place for worshiping primarily fertility gods. Um, there was goat worship. It was, but it was like an epicenter of paganism. And of all places for Jesus to take his disciples, he decides the Temple of Pan is the place to go. 
up in Caesarea Philippi. But you'll see why, I think, in a second. And as they're there, he, he, Jesus does this thing where he says, hey, who, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Right? He, he asks his disciples, who do, who, do, who do people say the Son of Man is? And he gets some various responses. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're a prophet. He says, but who do you say that I am? And I always love, like, when Jesus asks questions, clearly he knows the answer, right? So questions are invitations. So when you read your Bible, here's just a side note. When you read your Bible, whether it's in the Old Testament or New Testament, whenever God asks a question of someone, it's an invitation. You know, when in the garden, why are you hiding? Who, who told you that you were naked? That's an invitation. It's an invitation. Here, tell me what's going on. Tell me what's going on inside of you. Tell me the mis- you know, oh, admit your mistake, right? So questions are always invitations. And Jesus says here, who, who do you guys say that I am? You know, and I'm sure there was a lot of like foot shuffling going on. Like <laughs> some of the disciples are probably looking down going, ah, I don't know what you say. I don't want to say it. But of course, Peter, my favorite disciple, ready, fire, aim, Peter. He comes out and he says, you are the Messiah. Christ, the Son of the living God. He makes a clear proclamation of Jesus' divinity and of who he is in in light of the Old Testament. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon. You didn't figure this out on your own. But my Father opened your eyes and your heart to understand this. And then he gives him this new name, right? He goes, you've been called Simon, now you'll be called Peter, which means rock. And he says, and on this rock, I will build my church. It's the first time we see that word ecclesia, church, in the whole New Testament. So he's just saying, hey, like, this is, there's a new thing happening. Again, they're in the center of pagan worship. And Jesus is saying, hey, on, on this de- declaration, Peter, on, on what you proclaimed about who I am, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell or Hades are not going to prevail against it. Now, they're standing in front of what was called the gates of Hades, this grotto, where some would say there were sacrifices that went on. But it was at least a place of pagan worship. And uh, the, the, the believers there, the Romans believed it was like a gateway into the underworld um, in this natural cave with a grub. And he says, on the, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will prevail. In other words, G- Peter, on, on your proclamation, on the truth of who I am as Christ the Messiah, I will build a new kingdom and a new, create, a new, new community. And nothing's going to stand against it. And then verse 21 is really key. If you're there, you can look back a couple verses of verse 21. Jesus says, from that day forward, he began to share and show that he must suffer, die, and rise from the dead. So all of a sudden, like from that proclamation, there's a pivot point. And from that day forward, Jesus gets very, very explicit about the nature of why he's there. That he's not coming as a conquering king, at least not initially, but he's coming as a suffering servant. And that he was going to suffer at the hands of the Jewish authority in Rome, and that he was going to give up his life. That is not the Messiah that the Jews expected or wanted at all. And so they were going to have to begin to adjust their view of what their expectations were of Messiah. And you see that play out, right? Because then Peter pulls Jesus aside and rebukes him. No, never will that happen to you. Like, it's really strong language. He's like, nope, not going to let it happen. There's no way in heck that you're going to die, that that I'm going to let you be handed over to the Jewish authority. Again, Peter, bold words, right? A couple seconds ago, he was standing on top of the mountain. Now he's falling all all the way down the bottom of it. And Jesus responds by saying, hey, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. And then he says, "You you are thinking about concerns of man, not concerns of the Lord. So clearly... He's not calling Peter a name. What he's saying is, your thoughts right now, your ideals are not in alignment with mine. They are hindrance to you. You're worried about what the world thinks. You're thinking about what the world thinks about me. You're thinking about what, what you think the kingdom should look like and what you want it to be. And that is not the ways of God. So you see Jesus in this tug of war, right, with his disciples over who they want Jesus to be and who he knows he is. It's the same type of war that we tend to engage in with the Lord as well. And then we get to verse 24, and this is where we're going to spend our time. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. For what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world, yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? 
For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will reward each according to what he has done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Let me pray for us and then we'll unpack a few things from it. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. And Lord, we do we come to you and we want to come open-handed and open-hearted to what it is you want to teach us but then also what it is you want to change in us, God. So we ask for that. We ask, Lord, Holy Spirit, that you would come and change us, that you would help us to see you more clearly, to understand these truths, but then also, Lord, that you would help us to live them out in everything that we do, that we might faithfully follow you uh, for who you are and trust you with everything. We thank, this, thank you for all that you are and all that you do in your son's name. Amen. So again, yeah, Matthew, Matthew 16. Um, the first thing, when you talk about like these fundamentals for following Jesus, there's, there's these fundamental truths in this passage of what it means to follow Jesus faithfully and what it looks like. And the first one is this, that following Jesus is going to be... Oh, hey. There we go. Following Jesus requires the surrender of self. The following Jesus, again, none of this is going to feel earth shedding. This is going to be pretty obvious stuff, really easy to understand, really hard at times to live out. But following Jesus is going to mean it requires the surrender of self. See, almost everything in our culture right now is oriented around self-satisfaction. And think about all the advertisements. Like everything, you, the air you and I breathe in our culture is all about self-satisfaction, right? It's about your truth and your desires and what you want. I mean, you watch car commercials like, you deserve a new car. It's like, I don't deserve a new car, right? But there's this, and like, you don't have this thing. This is, what I, this is the whole ploy for advertisement. You lack this thing, so you lack. And if you had this thing, then you would be satisfied. And so go spend the money and get this thing, and then you'll be satisfied, right? But it's all centered on us. Like what we think we need and we want. In the passage, Jesus says, deny yourself. To, 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 to anyone who wants to come with him, it's deny himself. That word deny is, it's the strongest word you can use for this in the Greek. It's the idea of a decisive decision to utterly reject the self. It's a rejection of self-focus. It's turning away from centering all of my life on my expectations, my ideals, my opinions, what I think is best, where I think we should go, what I think would make most sense. Like, it's a rejection of that. It's, it's, it's not a partnership. It's going, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not trust my instincts because I'm going to trust that my instincts aren't trustworthy. And I'm going to start by just denying myself. It's a surrendering of my will to his ways, right? It's a surrender of self, his leading. The apostles get this later. If you look at both, uh, at all at three of them, Paul, James, and Peter, they start their writings, their letters. Um, in fact, I think Ephesians even starts this way, where it says, um, I, Paul, a, a slave of Christ Jesus. And the word's doulos in the Greek, and it means slave. It's, the, it's, a, it's a picture of someone who has no rights of themselves and lives at the um, beck and call of their master. That's what a doulos is. And Paul says, I am a doulos of Christ Jesus. James says, I am a doulos of Christ Jesus. Peter says, I am a doulos of Christ Jesus. Like, I deny myself. It is not about me. It's not about me feeling better or getting what I want. It's a self-denial, a self-surrender, a self-sacrifice. <clears throat> and again, like, we get this intellectually. Like, in, in, in the church, we get it, we're like, I'm, I'm trying, sort of. But if you're like me, what we tend to do is what I call selective <laughs> surrender. <laughs> so I pick and choose. I'm like, oh, happy to give that up, Lord. Praise Jesus. Yes, that's all yours. I'm going to hold on to this one, though. Like, this one I'm going to keep in my pocket because I think I've got a better handle on this. Like, I know you know everything, but do you realize how much, like, that I really need control? Like, Lord, I, I'm good. Like, I, I trust you with my, my family and my kids, but, like, my finances, like, I'm going to hold on to that, right? Because, it's like, do you really see how hard this is? Right? It's selective surrender. We tend towards selective surrender where we, there's this kind of like a, um, like, it's like a partnership with Jesus. Like, we'll link arms and we'll do it together. And he's like, actually, <laughs> what I would prefer is for you to deny yourself. 
And again, that is it inaction. It's actually the most active we can be. I think actually denying ourselves is the hardest thing we can do. It's not me sitting around going, oh, well, I hope he figures it out. <laughs> right? But it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a more about our heart's disposition. <clears throat> we want, in many ways, like we want to take and build our own kingdom within Jesus' kingdom. So Jesus has said, like, hey, you were my children, you were part of my kingdom. And again, think about a kingdom in the first century, right? Big walls, safe, protected. And so we've been brought into his kingdom, the safest place we could be, and then we're like, okay, how tall can I build my walls? Like, what will the HOA allow? Can I do like 10-foot walls around my own kingdom? And so then we want to build a kingdom within his kingdom so that we have autonomy and surrender, but it doesn't work that way. <clears throat> Eugene Peterson once said, the kingdom of self is a heavily defended territory. It's true, right? It's so hard for us to let go of this idea of denying. <clears throat> Look at verse 25, because I think Jesus kind of keeps going. He says, for whoever wants to save his life, in other words, whoever wants to hold on to the, that, that autonomy and that control will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will find it. You think about what Jesus is saying there. He's saying, look, the harder you try to be selective in your surrender, the harder you try to keep holding on to the certain things, the worse it's going to get for you. It's like golf. Any golfers? Not me, because I'm, I'm a horrible golfer. Because I, have, I want control. I just want to hit it really hard, and then it doesn't go anywhere. With, with golf, the harder you try and swing, the worse it is every time. Like it's all about relaxing and using your mechanics. And I just never could do it. I was too much of a I was a bull in a china shop. And this is what what Paul or what, uh, what Jesus is saying, right? Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Like the more you try and hold on, the more the tighter your grip is the more you're actually letting go, the harder it's going to be. It's kind of ironic, because we hold on to things to try and find peace, and in our efforts to hold on and grab hold of stuff, we actually lose the very thing we're looking for. Right? I want peace. I want security, I want peace, so I'm going to grasp at all these things to get security and peace. And then I, I'm working so hard to grab onto all these things, I actually have no security and no peace. Right? Because I'm trusting in me, I'm not trusting in I'm grabbing on and holding on to. See, following Jesus is going to mean the surrender of self. It's to deny myself is to actively, intentionally, daily, and at times moment by moment, decentralize off of me onto him. There's an initial denial, right, that, that, that I trust in Jesus to save me, that before I knew him, and then I said, I place my trust in him, I walk through that door of faith and go, Jesus, I trust that you are Lord, you are Savior, and that you can, you rule and reign, and I trust you. So there's an initial denial that we make of ourselves that I can't save or fix or rescue myself from my own sin. But then there's also an ongoing denial. The idea that my life is no longer my own, that I am now a doulos of Christ, that, that I serve whatever the master wants. If he says jump, I say, how high? Right? That's this ongoing journey of learning how to do this. It's following Jesus is going to be the surrender of self. And the reality is, is either Jesus is leading or I am leading. There is no partnership in that sense. There is no sense of like, I can't be both master and slave. I have to choose one. And this is both at a, at a, a global level, but also just in the individual, those, those different things that we struggle with in our life, our relationships, our marriages, our finances, our career path, like all of those things that we wrestle with. In each of those things, as I wrestle through those spots in my life, I have a choice. Am I going to try and be master or slave? And Jesus is saying, let me be master. You trust me. Serve me. Follow me. Be faithful. And I will provide for you all that you need. He promises it, right? It's not passive. It's, a, it's not a passive posture. It's an active choice. And Jesus won't force us to follow him. He doesn't force us. He's gracious. He's patient. Old Testament calls him long-suffering, right? He'll wait. He'll allow us to continue to try and lead our own lives and run ourselves into walls over and over again. He's <coughs> gracious in that. And he waits for us to turn ourselves back and to choose to surrender ourselves to him. So the first thing we see is this, that following Jesus means the surrender of self. The second thing is this. <clears throat> following Jesus requires an inverting of our identity. Um, as my teens and 20s, um, I went through a couple phases. 
So we were, as we were talking about this uh, earlier, I grew up in Los Angeles, and I actually, uh, funny enough, in Los Angeles went through a country phase of my life where I got really into country music. <laughs> I was wearing belts and buckles, and so I had like that. I, I didn't bring any pictures because I'm just too embarrassed to admit it. Um, but I went through like a country phase in my like late teens where it was like I was trying to find out who I was and, and what it meant to be me, and so chasing after my identity. And so I went through a country phase. Then I went through kind of like a, um, a like a rock star phase where it was like you know like coloring my hair different colors and trying to be cool and you know playing guitar and being in bands. And so we we have these like we go through phases, right? Like we have these different things, and it's 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 this um, trying to figure out who I am what defines me, and then how you, the, the people around me, see me. Like, when you see me, what, is, what do I display to you, right? That's what we do. Like, we dress a certain way, we carry ourselves a certain way, and in that, both intentionally and unintentionally, we're, we're telling people about us. You know, if I came in with 32 nose rings and all these, you, like, that would tell you something about me. I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm saying it would tell you something about me. Um, and so that, I went through that phase. Jesus says, deny yourselves. And then he says, take up your cross. This is really, really, really interesting. I think for a long time I thought exclusively of this idea around taking up my cross meant doing hard things, right? Which isn't untrue. That part of taking up my, I'm going to have to do hard things, I'm going to struggle, I have to make those decisions. But I think it goes even a little more deep, a little deeper than that. See, the cross, when Jesus says this, is a public display of shame for the criminal, and it's a display of power for Rome. So when you walked into, towards the city gates, and you saw criminals on crosses out front, dead or dying, that said something about them, and it said something about the town you were walking into. One, don't break the rules, right? And these guys did, and look at the shame, right? It, so it displayed something. The cross... It, 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 the condemned would carry, like you see this with Jesus, right? Carry the cross beam to the crucifixion site. It was the ultimate, ultimate symbol of humiliation and torture. There was no worse. Like, there really isn't even something comparable in our culture because we are, we have sanitized death. And, and I think, and, and like, we, we've given it honor and dignity in a way that they didn't. Like, they wanted it to look gross. They wanted it to be messy. Rome wanted you to know that they were not to be messed with. So it was this picture of shame, and Jesus says, take up your cross. The cross is an odd symbol to build a movement on. I know now we wear crosses around our necks, and we have crosses around our ears, and we have crosses on t-shirts, because the symbol has been redeemed, but at that point, that would be an absurd symbol to build a movement on. It's a symbol of shame, and sorrow, and suffering, and loss, it's a sign of failure, not success. It's the ultimate sign of failure. So when Jesus says, take up your cross, he's talking about also being, it being a public display of who you follow. You're identified now with a crucified Savior, with one who died. With, with the, at that point, the shame that would go along with that. He selflessly laid down his life for his enemies. He came as a suffering servant, not as a conquering king. We don't have little crowns that we wear on our, on our thing. We wear crosses, right? It's an inverting of our identity. It's, it's this idea. Um, I mean, think about this. By the world standard at that point, Jesus' life and ministry is a failure. Think about it. So this guy lived in obscurity in 30, for 30 years. He went around teaching and supposedly did some miracles for three years, and then they killed him. Not a winner by that standard. Now, we all know, rose from the dead, changes everything. But by their standards, this idea of Jesus being this conquering, heroic, powerful king is not reality. By the world standards. And see, our tendency is to believe that our worth and value comes through power and importance and significance. <laughs> Taking up your cross is actually inverting that. It's an inversion of our identity. We don't like we don't need to make Christianity cool again. Right? We don't we don't need to <clears throat> chase power and celebrity and 
try and dress up the gospel so that people might be a little more like, hey, that's cool. Like, there's this thing in us that, that thinks we need that. We, we, we don't need the power. We don't need the influence. The, the church has flourished far more in the margins over the centuries than it ever has in power. Power has always been a detriment to the church, um, historically. <laughs> but there's something in us, right, that we feel like, no, like, in order for me to have value and worth or for my faith, that value and worth, I need, I need, we need power, we need importance, we need big buildings, and, like, we need those things in order to have money, we need all those things in order for the church to be seen. You gotta have a big Instagram following or TikTok following, right? Like, those are the things that we think become where we find power and influence. But that's not where our value comes from. <clears throat> Paul says in 1 Corinthians that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. See, there's an inherent foolishness in following Jesus. There's a foolishness with identifying yourself with the cross. Not only just being willing to carry whatever <coughs> your cross is, but also the idea that you would say, this is the symbol of my heart and my life. This is where I rest. All, all my eggs are in this bag, basket called the cross. That seems ridiculous to the world. Paul continues his or thought in verse, I mean, I'm sorry, Jesus continues his thought in verse 26. <clears throat> what does it benefit a man to gain the whole world and lose his life? Or what will anyone exchange for his life? See, we spend our whole life chasing status and comfort and power and influence, both individually and I think the church does this too. I think this is where, especially in the West, we get wrong. Like the church chases after these things. <clears throat> we, we, we look at entertaining Christians versus discipling them, right? Like, we, we, we try and make things as comfortable and, and, and fun and cool as possible to try and draw people in again. I'm not saying that these things are all evil. I'm just saying these things aren't where our core identity is. That's not what taking up the cross is. The early church grew in persecution because Christians were willing to carry the cross. They were willing to identify with the crucified Savior and do the work that no one wanted to do. They were willing to go into the leper colonies and bring hope and healing and help. They were willing to hang out with the marginalized and the poor and the broken. It was, it was, it was fundamental. They were, they were willing to bury the dead, <clears throat> break their own cleanliness laws in order to take care of the fact that there, there were dead that weren't being properly cared for. Like That's what the early church did. And that's why they were seen um, and what would attract people to it. <clears throat> Instead of looking at power and position over sacrifice and service. There's a guy, uh, an author named Thomas Merton, and he said this, and I actually really appreciate this quote. He says, people may spend their whole lives climbing the ladder of success only to find once they've reached the top that the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. And that's kind of what happens here. And Jesus is saying, no, like, following means means an inversion of your identity. What you used to see as success may not be success anymore. To, to, to carry your cross means to identify with brokenness and seeming failure and suffering and struggle. It means being willing to dive into the margins and sit with those who weep and hurt and, and not the ones who can get you somewhere in life or not the ones who are going to be able to help you with things, and not the city council. Like it's, it's going to mean this type of a life. So following Jesus is an inverting of our identity. We're not the cool kids. We're not part of the cool kids club. We're slaves and we're servants of the cross. And so being able to let go of what the world defines as good and right and powerful <coughs> and successful. That's what it means to take up our cross, to identify with Jesus' suffering and his sacrifice, and then to follow him. Remember, I'm a doulos. Whatever you want, let me in. If you want me to go love the lost and the poor in the slums of Kenya, I'll go. If that's what you want from me, I'm there. If you want me to serve those who are marginalized and poor in my community or whatever, like I'm, I will do that. It's a death to whatever previously defined me, whatever I thought gave me worth and value. It's letting that go and saying, I'm defined by the cross. I'm defined by Jesus. And that's both the good things and the bad things, right? You're not defined by the good things you've done. You're not defined by the bad things you've done. You're not defined by the hurts you've experienced. Like the cross of Jesus supersedes all of that. It covers all of it. 
We are now a child of God who is covered in his grace and his mercy. When people see us, what they should see is us carrying our cross. And what that would mean is not about our influence, our political ideologies, our status, our wealth, our power, but seeing humility, love, grace, sacrifice. And it's going to look foolish to the world. The world will look at it and be like, that doesn't make any sense. It's a really bad idea. And it's probably a good sign that we're in the right path. So Jesus says, first, we talked about this, following Jesus means to surrender self, denying ourselves. Second, it means inverting our identity, taking up our cross. And third, and lastly, it means pursuing and persevering. Following Jesus requires pursuit and perseverance. You guys all remember the game Simon Says? You know, right? Simon Says, touch your head. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Simon says, touch your nose. Right? It's a game we played as a kid. It was the simplest game. The kids today don't play it. They probably don't even know what it is. But anyways. <laughs> but when Jesus says, it's like, well, maybe. Like, it seems like at times we see Jesus more like a financial advisor than a Lord. So it's like he calls, like, hey, so I think here's a good investment for you. You're like, okay, I'll take that under advisement. And then we kind of go about our way. But in early church, they, saw, they, they were called followers of the ways of Jesus. There was an intentionality. There was an activity in it. Moment by moment, day by day, they were, taking, they were denying themselves and taking up the cross. And they were putting Jesus at the center of everything in every environment. They, they weren't consumer-oriented in their walk with Jesus, and they weren't compartmentalized, right? That's, like, I think that's our tendency. Our tendency is to kind of make faith a consumer product. So it's like I go to church, and I consume a spiritual good, and that helps me throughout my week. And then I go, then the next week I've depleted, and I go back just the way I would go buy food at the store or things like that. Versus like um, an, an investment in, like I am, I am part of the church. I am part of this kingdom. I'm invested in it. I'm I'm, I'm giving what God's given me and what he's done in me and through me to others as well. So we see it as consumeristic, or we see it as compartmentalized, right? So it's like Sunday is church day, you know, maybe Wednesday study is church hour, and then the rest of my life I'm just kind of living my life. Like I'm not, it's not an integrated thing, it's compartmentalized. There's a difference though. There's a difference in that. And, and, and like what Jesus is calling us to is this idea of pursue, pursuing and perseverance that we're kind of always leaning in and towards him. Verse 27, he, he says, look, he says, like the son of man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father. And then he will reward each according to what he has done. Doesn't say he will record e, um, reward each according to what he knows. You know, how many Greek terms he learned, how much Hebrew he can talk about, how many seminary classes he can It's not, it's, what has he done? How has he integrated these things into his life? How has he pursued Jesus and persevered in the midst of the challenges? Each of us are going to stand before the Lord, the Lord exposed and accountable. Now, we do it all on the blood of Jesus. Like, we, it's by grace we're there. But somehow, in God's economy, there's going to be fruits of grace and accountability for how we lived out our faith. That we took it out of just an intellectual thing and we, we lived it. We, 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 lo we lived it out. And following Jesus is going to be uh, about pursuing and persevering. That maturity is going to be about more than just an accumulation of knowledge. It's going to be about a life that's transformed and then a, li a transformed life that's on display for others. That they may know, that they may see, that they may experience. That our coworkers might be like, hey, like that was a really hard thing that happened to work. How did you not lose your mind? <laughs> and not be like, well, I just have a lot of patience. But be like, hey, you know what? Everything in me wanted to lose my mind. But I believe that there's a God who's with me and for me and protecting me and reminding me that he's bigger than all these things. And so that helps me in those spaces. Right? That's how we pursue, how we persevere is telling those stories. It's, it's this idea of a pastor I grew up with who used to say it's listening and responding. Like simple, obedience is simple as listen and respond. Listen to the word, listen to the spirit, and then respond. So the Lord leads you, and my job is to listen and respond. That's, that's, that's my rhythm and my posture. Following is not perfection. I say it again, following is not perfection. It's about pursuit and perseverance. That we are faithful to seek him, 
that we listen and we respond to him, that we confess and we repent when we mess up, and that we rest in his grace. And that we do that moment by moment, day by day, all throughout our life. We deny ourselves, we take up our cross, and we follow him. And as we follow him, we become more like him. The word Christian means little Christ. That's all it means. The more time we spend with him, the more we end up aligning with him. The more we trust him, the more our heart aligns with his heart, the more we care about the things that he cares about. It's this kind of byproduct of being with someone. The more you're with them, the more you kind of become like them. We start to care about what he cares about, love the things that he loves, and serve the way that he serves. So fundamentals are following, right? God has lovingly and purposely designed you and I to flourish as we follow him. That's the best way. That's you operating at peak performance, as it is following him. And that means it's going to mean, fundamentally, it's going to mean a surrender of myself, that I have to decentralize my life off of me and begin to sacrificially serve others. Trust the Lord and serve others. That it's going to mean an inversion of my identity. It means that the cross now defines me, that I don't have to try and be a cool kid. I'm now a slave and a servant. That's my, that's my heartbeat. And it's going to mean pursuing and persevering which is going to be this listening and responding to him, obeying to his will and his ways, and sticking with it. Which is why we need community, right? It's why we need the church. Because on my own, I don't have the strength to do that. When things get hard, I don't have the strength to do that. I need other people coming alongside me going, hey, hang in there. He's still on the throne. He's still with you. He's still for you. That's what the church is for. So as we wrap up, I just encourage you to reflect a little bit. What does this look like for you? What does is, what is following Jesus look like to you? What does it look like for following Jesus, for denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following him look like in, in your life to make it your highest priority? What does it look like in your family? What does it look like in your community or in the workplace that you work at? What does it look like here? It's part of grace. Like, what does it look like for me to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him moment by moment, day by day, Scripture promises over and over again. Jesus promises that it won't be easy, but it's going to be worth it. Like, if it was easy, everyone would do it. <laughs> it's clearly not easy because not everyone's doing it. But we do have his grace. We have his spirit. We have one another. He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. That's 2 Peter 1. And so we can trust him and we can rest in that. So let me do this. I'm going to pray for us. And... and and then we're going to respond in worship. So let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you. And Lord, I just want to, like, for each of us here, Lord, we all come at different places in our spiritual journey with you. And Lord, I just want to give us a second to, to just reflect and, and not rush. I'm always so rushed. So Lord, I pray that you would bring to mind and heart things for each of us that would be encouraging or challenging that would help us to draw near to you, to follow you better, to rest in you, to trust you. Lord, I pray for each of us that for this week you would give us a, a, a little bit more of like, what is this week? What does it look like for me to deny myself? What's one area? I don't need all the areas, just one area that I can learn to deny myself. What's one, one way that I could take up my cross, that I could identify more so or share who you are and what you've done in me. And then what does it look like for me to follow you, to persevere and pursue you, more so than I have up until now? Lord, I pray you would reveal that to us, that we might draw close to you and experience your presence and your power in ways that maybe we've never experienced before. Thank you so much for this church and for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you that no matter what, you are always pursuing us. You are with us and you are for us. We pray this all in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. 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 Let's turn to page 312.